Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for arriving very early for Sebastian's talk about beautiful uh, real-time ray marching uh, after the session. Uh, until then, I'll be talking about uh, the inside uh, shipping uh, and how we did that on iOS. And then I'll, I'll round it off with a little bit of real-time ray tracing just to sort of warm you up for Sebastian's talk afterwards. Um, so, yeah, I'm from uh, Playdead. Uh, Playdead did a game called Limbo uh, a couple of years ago in 2012. We then uh, released Inside uh, in 2016. So I'm not going to talk about how we actually made those games. I'm just going to talk about how we shipped them, uh, which is something we've done uh, quite a lot over the last couple of years. So we uh, initially sh we've shipped on five different platforms, or so four, and, and Switch is almost there. Um, so we, we kind of feel by now that we're, we're pretty good at, uh, at actually going through that process. So, so that's what I'll talk about. So uh, the agenda for today is I'll, I'll sort of go over the, the, uh, the, our rough approach uh, to how we, we go about that, the tools that we use, that we've uh, built most of those, um, a few iOS-specific details, and then a little bit on the, uh, the tiled architecture of uh, the uh, mobile devices. So of course, I didn't, I didn't actually do all the porting and building and stuff myself. Uh, so Inside was obviously made by Playdead, and the iOS port was worked on by, by all these uh, beautiful people. So um, for the iOS port, our target was to have the exact same game running. So we didn't want to do like a mobile conversion of the game. Um, the way we achieved that was primarily uh, to lower the resolution a little bit and run it at 30 FPS rather than 60. Uh, we also did a little bit of optimization, but uh, to be honest, uh, we were kind of surprised by how fast the devices are. Um, so sort of the high-end mobile CPUs and GPUs are roughly on par with laptops, which uh, sort of took us uh, aback. So one of the things that uh, we did have to do was to uh, cut one gigabyte, uh, one gigabyte memory devices. So being a, a console uh, game and not wanting to cut any content, we did have to use um, quite a lot of, of memory on the devices. Uh, unfortunately, there's no way to actually filter for that in the App Store. So what we ended up doing was making the initial part of the game a trial and then have this upsell point uh, with in-app purchases. Um, that way people could, they could still download the game and then as they had downloaded the game, we could check how much memory was available on the device and then we could either run the full game or we could run this uh, beautiful uh, trial screen, oh, sorry, not trial screen, but sort of, uh, we're really sorry we, we can't run on your device screen and, and hopefully people would be less uh, unhappy with that. They, they're of course still disappointed, but at least they didn't pay for uh, the disappointment. So as we uh, started thinking about the, uh, the mobile port, um, we uh, were just finished with uh, the, the, uh, the main releases, the console releases. Um, so those weren't really ports. We sort of had uh, PlayStation and Xbox running alongside PC for at least the last uh, couple of years of production to make sure that, that uh, the work we were doing actually uh, worked everywhere. So after releasing those, we did, uh, we sort of patched up those releases and then we started upgrading. So we were running Unity and uh, we started upgrading Unity from uh, the, uh, the custom 5.0 that we released consoles on to 5.6. Um, so so there was, this was sort of an, an initial uh, upgrade of Unity. Um, we, uh, we do have source code for Unity, so we had made some changes. Of course, we had to, to sort of move those over as well. Um, we removed some of the updates like the uh, multi-threaded renderer, uh, seeing as that was actually uh, integrated, or rather Unity had done it themselves since then, so there was no use for that. But there was a, there was a bit of work with that as well. We then did uh, an initial uh, iOS port just to make sure that it actually ran and to uh, sort of gauge how much work was, uh, uh, did we, we needed to, how much work we needed to do to actually get that, that running. So our initial, um, our initial impression, or the like, as soon as we had actually made that port, we see that it was running uh, quite a bit beyond expectation. We thought we had to do a lot of work, and it was running. Everything was broken, and um, it didn't look right at all. But we could play through the game, and it was hitting around 30 FPS. So uh, we were pretty confident that we could actually um, make that work within a reasonable amount of time. And that was the better part of a year of bug fixing, um, 
bugs from the Unity upgrade, uh, some bugs from shaders that were being very specific about what they were doing on uh, the platforms that they were on. Um, some relating to, to Unity as well, uh, sorry, to iOS as well. Uh, the majority of, of bugs we encountered, uh, I have to say, was from uh, upgrading Unity, um, in part because we were doing things that were way too specific, and in part because Unity um, sort of updated some things as they should and optimized things, but we were just being very specific on, on the, uh, the use of, of Unity at the time. Of course, uh, alongside this, um, we were doing a sort of actual game work, integrating with uh, the App Store and Game Center for achievements, um, actually doing the, the touch interface for, uh, for the game and, and that sort of thing. All right, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, profiling, uh, because that was a big part of the, uh, uh, the porting um, as well. So we actually did a presentation at Unite last year, and if you're interested in sort of way uh, more detail, then uh, you should go watch that one. It's on, on YouTube, it's from Unite, I think I said that. All right, so initially when we move to a new platform, uh, the, the first thing we need to know, and sort of the easiest thing to know is what's the actual performance that we have on the device? Um, so we can sort of know <clears throat> uh, how, how much do we need to, uh, to uh, optimize to actually get uh, device running. Second thing then, when we know that the performance is bad, which is usually the case, we then know, need to know what are the actual bottlenecks and uh, what causes sort of specific uh, issues. And then when we optimized, uh, this specific area, then we need to know if it was actually faster in the end or we just changed stuff and it didn't change anything. So uh, what we do is this, uh, on the top we have uh, the full inside game as it's laid out. And at the bottom you can see uh, the performance at any point in the game. Uh, green is of course fast enough, which is usually uh, below 16 milliseconds. And uh, orange and red if it's, if it's really bad. Um, so left to right, the full game, left to right, the full game in, in profiling underneath. So the way we generate this is we use Kel. Um, Kel is our QA guy. Uh, we record every playthrough he does, and uh, then we can play that back on uh, automated on devices. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, so what it does is uh, records everything that he does, and then we play that back, and then we do profiling on these runs. Um, and we can do that sort of every night. Uh, it's, it's pretty easy, so we can sort of get a, a history of, um, of performance over time. Um, we can also do, uh, every, if we receive a new um, piece of hardware, we can just run this, and we, if that completes, we're sort of pretty sure that it works. Um, of course, it, it catches crashes and that sort of thing um, as well. So what we get out of that is, as you can see at the top, we have this uh, very small history I uh, think that we can uh, click and then click through uh, all the dates that we have uh, captures from. And we have all the usual uh, uh, Unity profiling stats, so CPU time, um, all the rendering stats, the memory, um, and then for every point in the game, we also have full call stack with instrumented profiling of that. And then uh, at the bottom of screenshot, we actually know which part of the game we are, we're currently looking at. Um, we also get uh, this, um, uh, present, uh, we also do this presentation, which again is all the other um, uh, uh, statistics along with uh, the GPU time, uh, what we call glass time, which is how long did a frame actually uh, reside on uh, the screen. So we can see if uh, we missed a frame or not. So the, uh, the red spikes in the third uh, row are, are missed uh, frames where we actually dropped frames. Um, then we have the full memory in the, uh, in the middle, and then below we can see what content, sort of streaming details, what content's actually uh, loaded in at any point. Um, and below are audio events and, and that sort of thing. <clears throat> All right, so that, that gives us a pretty good overview of uh, the performance in the game, so we can kind of dive into specific areas and figuring out uh, why they're slow. So one thing to note is that uh, these are not primarily gaming devices. They are made for, uh, I suppose, primarily for uh, other things, uh, including Facebook and cute kittens and that sort of thing. So quite often uh, when you're profiling, you'll get interrupted by <clears throat> our background services that will do other things. Um, so of course, this makes perfect sense for a mobile 
uh, platform and it's not something we can actually uh, change out in the wild, but while profiling, it makes sense to sort of clean the device of everything and <clears throat> turn off Wi-Fi and mobile data and all those things. So, uh, so you actually have sort of less noise while profiling. So the, the second thing that's interesting is that it's of course, um, uh, it, the, uh, the device will, of course, uh, throttle the, uh, the CPU, uh, primarily for two reasons. Uh, one is if it gets too warm, it will, it will uh, reduce uh, the speed to, to cool down. And the second, is that it will, second thing is that it will uh, do so just to save battery. So it's trying to run at the lowest uh, clock frequency that it can. So an interesting thing that happened was that our external uh, QA uh, company uh, called VMC, they came back complaining that the devices were getting uncomfortably hot. <clears throat> so of course, what we did as all good engineers is that we went out and bought an industrial grade uh, thermometer to figure out what uncomfortably hot meant. And it turns out that's actually uh, quite uh, cool. So it's around 40 degrees that you start a, so, sort of start sweating and feeling like, okay, maybe my phone won't actually survive this. Um, and a, a curious consequence of that is that we actually have to target the game not at device spec, but at human spec, which is uh, somewhat uh, lower. So as an example, the uh, iPhone X, we can actually run that at 60, uh, the entire game at 60 FPS without any problem, but it gets really warm and, uh, and uh, yeah, we, we decided to run it at 30 instead and then have a cool device that people were happy with and uh, not feeling like we were breaking their, their phone. Although it's, it's quite fine to run it uh, hotter. So we get into this scenario where we, <clears throat> we sort of want to uh, hit like a middle uh, section when, when uh, uh, profiling. So we want to not have the device too warm so that it starts thermal throttling. We also don't want to run it uh, at too low a, uh, a workload so that it starts battery saving. <clears throat> um, there's sort of different approaches to this. Apparently uh, Carmack uh, has a uh, fridge next to his desk that he puts the phones in. Um, we had a guy from Apple who just sort of took the phone and put it in a bowl of water because it was certified for that, so that should be fine. I won't recommend either of those, um, primarily though, because I don't actually think that that uh, area is really um, there, I suppose. Like the device will always try to battery save. It will always try to run at the lowest possible frequency, so the, uh, the CPU frequency will, uh, will always vary. Um, an implication of this, of course, is that <coughs> Sorry. So an implication of this, of course, is that uh, if you optimize something um, to make it twice as fast, then you may not actually see that on uh, the, uh, the, the profile times. Maybe it just reduces uh, the CPU uh, speed. So we kind of need to know what the CPU speed is. is. So we, uh, we did this. Uh, in-game uh, overlay where we can see uh, the CPU speed along with all the other uh, metrics that we had before as well. And the way we do that um, is that we, uh, at startup, we try to, we, we sort of assume that the device is not overheating, then we run the, uh, some workload, we run that uh, a lot of times so that we are pretty sure that the frequency is as, at its maximum. And then we uh, time uh, that a couple of times, and then we figure out what the uh, f absolute fastest um, execution, sp execution speed was uh, for that workload. That way we think that we have the, the fastest that this device can possibly run. And then at runtime, uh, while we're profiling, we then run the same workload, uh, though a lot fewer times, and then again, pick the best of, of those. And then we think that we have a, uh, an estimate for uh, the current speed, and then by comparing to the faster speed, we can then uh, figure out what the, uh, the CPU, current CPU speed is roughly. And that, that seems to, uh, to work pretty well. So we, we only did that for, this, for the CPU. It kind of looks like the GPU is doing something similar. This is running at 30 FPS, I think. And uh, we can kind of see these sort of waves on the GPU that, that kind of uh, indicate that uh, it may be uh, over quite a long time, actually, uh, turning uh, the CPU. Uh, GPU speed up and down as well. Um, this is something that's also affecting us when we're doing um, profiling even in, in uh, Xcode, which is Apple's uh, uh, tool to, uh, uh, to do profiling. So on the left, 
and on the right uh, you have um, 10 different uh, samples in Xcode where we have a full frame of insight <clears throat> and we are trying to profile uh, the uh, how fast a, a single draw call is and it's around one and a half milliseconds on the left and uh, but the variance of that is around half a millisecond. So that's, that's quite a long time. So in, on the right, we then try to optimize that by removing half the math that's in the shader. And we can see statistically that it's faster. But unfortunately, um, sort of a single sample is, is not enough. So the, whole, like the fast iteration of changing source code within Xcode and then recompiling is, uh, is, is a bit hard to, uh, to get, get functional. So for, for bigger things, what we did was that we actually looked at the full uh, GPU capture of the entire game. So we, um, we captured the whole thing and then we kind of visually inspected uh, one versus the other. And I'll get back to this uh, in a little bit. So um, I suppose the, the takeaway from this is that it was actually pretty hard to get sort of concrete performance metrics um, GPU-wise uh, and, and CPU-wise as well. Uh, the device that we found that was the most stable was the uh, new Apple TV. Uh, it has an active cooler on it, so at least it doesn't uh, thermal throttle too easily. Um, it was very handy for us to know the CPU scaling. Uh, there was a lot of things that we, we sort of didn't, uh, were unable to, to uh, find otherwise. Um, and uh, of course, these tools that would get us the uh, performance uh, in the entire game was, were very uh, helpful. All right, so one thing that we did actually find and that we could see in Xcode uh, is that every time you load a shader, um, the, um, the shader will get recompiled to what's called, oh, actually, that, that is, that's not true. So the first time you load a shader, uh, it will get recompiled to what's called metal or uh, intermediate representation. And then uh, all subsequent uh, loads of the game will just use uh, the cache from the, the first load. But then as you uh, draw something with that uh, shader the first time, it will then patch up uh, and recompile the shader intermediate representation um, to match the blend state and uh, render target states and, and vertex formats <coughs> for that. So that would uh, generate a stall um, uh, sort of throughout the game the first time we were using every shader. So of course we did, as, as has been done for a number of years, um, we warmed up uh, the shaders for that. So <coughs> we first needed to gather all the different variants of every shader that was used uh, throughout the entire game. So we did that in, uh, in playthroughs before actually doing the build and then um, collecting those for the warm up and then uh, rendering triangles and with no, uh, an off-screen render target and rendering triangles with all the variants of shaders to uh, sort of show the, uh, the driver, <coughs> all the variants of all the shaders that we, that we would come about. Um, that of course meant that we added some time to the, uh, the initial load time, which was quite long on, on the first load. Uh, one of the reasons was that the <coughs> driver was converting from the Messel shader language into this intermediate representation. Fortunately, you can um, generate that yourself. So we ended up storing that on, on disk instead, then loading that, doing the warm up, and then we, uh, we didn't get any, any sort of stalls uh, during the game at least. Um, we only had this, this uh, overhead of initial uh, warm up. All right, so I'll talk a little bit about, about finding <coughs> our visual errors. Uh, quite often, that this is where um, our porting work starts, so either you bugs will represent themselves as performance issues or as visual bugs, um, or both. <coughs> so what we do for that is that we have a, uh, an automated screenshot tool as well that takes uh, Kelly's, uh, prof uh, Kelly's uh, playthrough, and then every couple meters it will uh, load that and then do a screenshot, dump that to disk, and then load a new place. So that gives us um, the option of uh, comparing between um, a, any you know, any platform, we can compare that to a platform that uh, we f think is, uh, is, is uh, correct. So um, that, that's not actually that, that easy a thing to do. So we have these two images and we want to know what, what the difference between them is. So what we ended up doing on console was we kind of sort of uh, loaded one and then flipped to the other one, sort of went back and forth a couple of times. And we sort of see that there's this dude on the right that's disappearing. Um, of course, with a full playthrough that ends up with 
uh, a lot of time uh, spent just comparing these things, and we kind of wanted to automate that as well. <coughs> the problem is that the game is only almost deterministic, so we have uh, some animation and particles and um, even some characters in the game that are generated uh, dependent on the time that the game started. Um, so it's not, it's not sort of fully deterministic, so we kind of have to, uh, to um, uh, handle that. <clears throat> so what we do is that we have a set of reference images. So for every pixel, we have all the values that that pixel can, uh, can be in, in our reference images. We then generate a bounding box uh, around those, and then that, that sort of gives us this, uh, well, I suppose, inverse confidence map that will tell us uh, which areas of the uh, image will, of this location will typically change the most. <clears throat> Um, when we then want to test our new platform, we can then compare that to, uh, to these reference images. We can do that by just calculating the distance to the bounding box of, uh, of all these reference images. Um, and that gives us a, uh, an error that looks like this, where we can see uh, the dude on the right is, was missing, or there was, there was some errors there. Um, there's also quite a bit of noise in that image, um, which we've spent a lot of time introducing in Inside. Um, they're not, it's not really conductive to actually finding the error. So what we do is we median filter that, and then we uh, sort of sum the top 10 uh, errors in, in pixels, and then, uh, then uh, use that as the error of the image from the image. Um, so one thing the, the confidence map doesn't handle uh, is uh, sort of very large scale uh, changes. So as you can see here, so the um, the leaves are moving, and that's kind of fine, but we have all these dots, which are particles that are sort of moving around the image. Um, so rather than have uh, an infinite number of reference, Im reference images and then ending up with dots everywhere, and just all white, which would mean that we couldn't actually check anything, what we do is that we have uh, an additional reference image. We then compare that to the other reference images to sort of get a usual error in a specific spot. So uh, these particles will will uh, have like a base error, and we need to know that to, uh, to compare a, uh, a different platform to those. All right, so what we get from that then is it, it spits out um, a HTML page uh, sorted by error, where we can uh, see the error image and a reference image and the test image, and then we can kind of open those in two different tabs and then go back and forth. So that, that doesn't seem like much progress, but at least now they're sorted and we know which uh, images to look at, and uh, it's, it's far less than the uh, 1,300 errors that, uh, that we had initially. All right, so of course, there, there are some things that it doesn't handle. Unfortunately, there are some things it doesn't handle. So for example, if we have a flickering light, <coughs> light like this, then the, uh, all the pixels within that light can essentially assume any uh, uh, any color, any intensity at least. So it becomes pretty hard to actually go and find uh, errors within that region because any uh, pixel value is, uh, is valid. <clears throat> all right, so I'll talk a little bit about rendering uh, because I can and you're all, you're all here. Um, so most of the optimization we did um, on the GPU side are not overly interesting, sort of uh, grunt, grunt work optimization. Um, <clears throat> The one thing that, that might be a bit interesting is that uh, the mobile platforms are uh, tiled architecture. Um, I'm not going to go too much into that and what that means. I'll just talk about what that meant for, for us with Inside. So primarily it meant that we had to switch uh, render, pass, uh, render targets less. We needed fewer render passes, so switching render targets less often. And then uh, it's also required <coughs> that uh, for the tile, you actually uh, manage which uh, data gets flushed uh, in and out of that tile uh, as you switch uh, render targets. So this is what our console pipeline looked like, the graphics pipeline. Um, so the first thing that we notice is that uh, the shadow maps and the lights are interleaved. <coughs> we did that so we only needed a single shadow map and we did then render to that, render the light with that shadow map and, and so on and so forth. Um, so of course that uh, then flushes the full light buffer in and out of uh, tiles. Um, so instead uh, pre-rendering the shadow maps, that means that we, um, yeah, that we, we don't need to do that. Uh, we can also see that and, and uh, the light buffer stays a resident on tile. 
Uh, second thing, of course, is the uh, green volumetric pre-rendering. Um, that's also sort of wedged in between the final pass and the translucency pass. Both of them are accessing the, uh, the back buffer. So again, just moving that before the final pass then means that uh, the back buffer can stay resident during the final and translucency passes. Um, then, of course, there's the post effects that then change render target 21 times because we're doing this bloom filter um, that's generating a mid map uh, pyramid. Um, so, fortunately, uh, those render targets are, are pretty small, so bandwidth wise, it's, it's not that bad. Uh, there is an overhead <coughs> um, on the driver side of around two and a half milliseconds on the, on the CPU. Um, that would go away if we converted all the post effects passes to compute instead. Um, which, uh, which we probably should. But there was no uh, GPU overhead that we could see. All right, so the second thing, sorry. <coughs> the second thing we needed to do was to actually set up uh, the, what's called uh, the, the loads and stores um, for the, uh, uh, the tile for, uh, for every, so we set it up on render passes. And um, we do that so that you sort of manually can control which, uh, what data is, like whether or not you actually need to load the data from a render target, or and if, you, if you manually set up whether you, uh, you change it as you write it out to the, whether you need to write it out to the render target afterwards as well. Um, so, yeah, so, so I suppose it's, uh, it's pretty, Obvious in, in a way. So uh, the lights all are, I guess we'll start from the start. So the base pass generates a uh, depth buffer, and then the light pass will then uh, render lights and check against that uh, depth buffer. So, of course, it doesn't actually modify the depth buffer, it just reads the data and uh, checks light geometry against that and then uh, writes to the lighting buffer. So there's no read to actually, no need to, um, to write the depth buffer out again, which it sort of would by, by default. Same thing goes for the <coughs> final pass and the translucency pass. They all just read from the depth buffer and do depth comparison, but they're not, not actually modifying the depth buffer. So again, no, no need to, uh, to write those out. Um, so uh, the way you actually check uh, these things is that you look in Xcode. It has uh, stats for that where you can see it's a good thing to sort of go, go through all your render passes and see whether they're doing what you expect them to do if it's necessary to do all the loads and stores that, uh, that they do. Um, <coughs> uh, you can also see uh, the load and store bandwidth and, uh, and, and look at that. So after doing all the reshuffling of the passes and um, the load store optimization, we sort of have the, the load bandwidth and um, not, not quite half this, the store bandwidth. So <coughs> what, what does that, that actually mean for the, uh, the game? Well, that <coughs> means that we, kind of get this, this graph for the entire game, which is sort of, this is how we, we sort of inspected things. We looked at it and went like, well, this, this part's kind of better and this part, part is, is worse. Um, so all in all, it, uh, it looked better. So fortunately, my flight here was delayed, so I had time to uh, actually run some stats on it. <clears throat> and we can see that uh, it, it did actually uh, sort of significantly improve, or well, significantly a couple of milliseconds. Uh, around a couple of milliseconds uh, improvement uh, in doing this work. It's not too much work either, so uh, I would say that, that pays off. Okay, <clears throat> so for um, one, one interesting thing about releasing on mobile, um, releasing a console game on mobile, is that now your game is being played everywhere, like rather than only on televisions, it's actually being played uh, in a bus or outside or, or elsewhere. So one thing that we did was that we uh, chose to brighten the entire game. It's, it's quite a dark game to begin with. Um, so we, we chose to, to brighten the entire thing up. And uh, we did that uh, for a couple of reasons. Like one was so that people could actually play it so that they could get the game bright enough to, uh, to see what was going on. Then secondarily, of course, <clears throat> if, you, um, if you brighten the game, then you don't have to increase the uh, backlight brightness as much. So you're also saving battery. And finally, because you're not increasing the backlight uh, brightness as much, then it's not generating as much uh, heat, so you then get better performance. So it, it kind of makes sense to, uh, to look at that in, uh, in sort of a separate, separate way. And the way we, the uh, sort of the function we used to do that is the same that we used for uh, in-game 
uh, brightness, which is uh, just multiplying up the, uh, the color values and then doing this uh, soft minimum uh, with one, which, uh, which has worked quite well for us. And then, of course, in the end, we then just fit the, the final function with a polynomial, polynomial so that it's, it's as fast as we can sort of get it. All right. I'll talk a little bit about a, uh, an issue we had on the shipped game, um, <clears throat> which was this. It was uh, one of the, the few things that we, we didn't manage to fix for, uh, for console. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, so this, this truck side is obviously uh, aliasing horribly. You see on the right that the temple lens aliasing that we're using didn't uh, fix that at all. Uh, the reason uh, for the uh, uh, the problem, of course, is undersampling, and we're using um, uh, uniform samples <coughs> across. Uh, well, we're, we're doing rasterization, so we're getting uh, uniform samples um, of, um, of of the truck side as we're rasterizing. Um, of course, when we're doing the temporal anti-aliasing, we still use uniform samples. We just get a lot of them. Um, which causes the temporal anti-aliasing to then not uh, pick anything from the, uh, the history buffer. The reason why it does this is that uh, our temporal anti-aliasing solution uses this uh, local uh, neighborhood uh, color clamping. So it looks, every pixel looks at its neighborhood and all values that are present in the neighborhood are, uh, are accepted from, uh, from the history buffer. Um, of course, if you look on, on the left, uh, the pattern that's generated by this undersampling uh, is quite wide, so the local pixel neighborhood uh, becomes uh, almost uh, uniform in color, <clears throat> which means that we, we're not actually accepting anything from the history buffer, and we just end up with, with this uh, uh, undersampling, these undersampling artifacts. So if we turn off the, uh, the neighborhood clamping as in the middle, then we can see that uh, it, it converges nicely, but um, of course, then if we start moving the uh, picture around, we get uh, terrible ghosting. So a uh, solution to this, of course, then is to jitter the sampling. Uh, unfortunately, that's not something that we can do with, um, uh, with rasterization and the, the fixed uh, function rasterization. So what we did then was to, um, to choose to ray trace the truck side instead and sort of patch that up and render it afterwards. <clears throat> that way, we can always uh, manually uh, choose the uh, the ray offset within a pixel, um, and then uh, yeah, that that way uh, jitter the, uh, the the samples that we do. So um, I should mention that that we just like this is not integrated in, in the pipeline as such. We're just rendering it rendering it afterwards and sort of manually um, putting all lights and decals and anything else that interacts with. Uh, the truck side within the shader, so it's it's not really a uh, the, the most the prettiest uh, solution. Um, <clears throat> so in order to do this, uh, we uh, we manually um, modeled uh, the uh, the side of the truck as uh, the as procedural planes. So we um, first figure out what a groove we're in along the uh, the truck side, and then as we know that we. Uh, the, uh, the T zero, like the first intersection, we can just get from the position on the truck side, and then we can calculate uh, the intersection with the bottom plane um, just by the angle of the, uh, of the ray that we, uh, uh, that we send out. And then we do four intersections with uh, the sides of uh, the grooves of the truck, and then we can then figure out where we, we are hitting it. So uh, that results in something like this. So in the middle, you have uh, the jittered version where we are ray tracing. Uh, we're using the, the procedural uh, geometry for the truck side. And then on the right, as we're applying uh, temporal anti-aliasing to that, <coughs> uh, every pixel in its pixel neighborhood will see quite a lot of variance, and then it will accept um, uh, values again from the, uh, from the history buffer. So uh, one thing we noticed was that it wasn't actually aliasing um, in the y direction, so we could get away with only sort of multi-sampling uh, horizontally. So other than jittering, we're also doing uh, four samples <coughs> to, uh, to sort of decrease our cost, uh, sorry, to, uh, to uh, decrease uh, aliasing as much as possible, um, but only horizontally. 
Um, then, of course, uh, we don't need to calculate everything per sample. So some of the things we are evaluating are ones like the uh, projected light uh, textures. We're only evaluating those um, at the surface, and then we're just reusing those between samples. So <clears throat> one thing to note, of course, is that we uh, didn't actually have to do uh, this uh, through ray tracing. We could have just used some texture-based displacement uh, method instead. <clears throat> um, we chose to do this as we uh, figured it was faster rather than doing uh, sort of jitted samples um, in the displacement texture and many samples. And uh, it also turned out to be pretty fast. We didn't actually implement uh, a texture-based version. So I uh, honestly can't say whether it was faster. But it, was, it was fast enough for our use. All right. So in, in summary, I suppose <clears throat> one of our main um, takeaways, I guess, was that this, these are actually platforms that can run full quality uh, console games. We were kind of uh, surprised by the speed of these, these devices. Um, the, the second thing then is that it, it is really hard to actually profile uh, on them. And, uh, it, it takes quite a lot of effort, and uh, it's been a great benefit for us to have uh, the tools that we used also for consoles um, to, uh, to sort of guide us in, in the profiling for, for these platforms as well. Um, we found we used the screenshot uh, comparison tool quite a lot in uh, actually making sure that all devices looked correct. We would sort of do playthroughs and look <clears throat> at the game and look, compare it to console versions and say, oh yeah, like it looks, looks about right. And then we'd run a screenshot tool and we would have like 20 bucks that we didn't visually uh, notice. Um, and then of course, the, uh, the tiled uh, rendering optimizations um, are reasonably easy to uh, approach. So I think it makes sense to, uh, to spend time doing that. I'd like to thank all these people who, uh, who uh, helped us out with uh, the port. And uh, thanks to you guys for listening. I hope <clears throat> some of this was uh, well, it made sense, and uh, maybe even some of it was interesting. Um, if uh, at any point during this uh, presentation you thought, I could do that better, um, please do. And um, yeah, a little bit for questions if you have any. Thank you. So please come and ask some questions to Mike, Mikkel. <clears throat> Hi, thank, thanks, you. thanks for a great presentation. Uh, did you actually test the optimizations and, and modifications you did uh, back on consoles and other platforms? So do these optimizations only work for iOS? Do they hurt the other platforms? So we have, no, we haven't uh, backported uh, those. So. Um, most of the optimizations that we did, like all the grunt work, <clears throat> that applies to all uh, the platforms, pretty much. Uh, we didn't test the tiled optimizations. Um, I know, like the Xbox has also has like a uh, um, uh, the uh, the embedded RAM that you're rendering to, so there might be uh, advantages in, in doing similar things there. Okay, thank you. I, I suppose the difference there is that it can actually do it asynchronously, like flush uh, the ESRAM back and forth. Yeah, of course, you need a little bit more memory for the shadow maps and so on. But yeah, yeah, that as well. OK, thank you. Of course. Anything else? Yeah. <clears throat> Hi. Thank you for the talk. So I have a question about testing by Kyle. So you, how did you record it and then play it again on different devices? And how did you set up all the devices you needed to play through the night and then get results? So, um, yeah, so, so two things, I suppose. Like, uh, the first is we, we just record input. Um, we also record position. So <clears throat> we, uh, we play back the input uh, that, that Keller makes. And then if, we, if he gets if it gets too far from uh, the location that we recorded, we sort of teleport the main character back to there. So we're sure that it doesn't get too far off sync. Um, 
<clears throat> so for, for iOS, we didn't actually do the automated uh, playback at night. Uh, we did that for all for consoles. Uh, we did that manually. We just uh, started that manually on devices um, uh, for testing. Or rather, we had Keller do it. Hi. Uh, so, when you are profiling on mobile devices, uh, have you had any performance drop-downs just because you are profiling, because you have to run development, build, some de de debug information, all the statistics and screenshots, it sounds like it will take quite a bit of CPU time. <coughs> yeah. Uh, we, we're not seeing... Uh, so I think we're streaming. So it's not, it's not that much uh, memory that we're using for just recording our CPU times and that sort of thing. Um, so I don't think our system, uh, it probably ha like has some overhead, but I don't think it, it, we haven't noticed an overhead. It's pretty hard to actually notice that as well because we would then have to profile that, I suppose. Um, one thing that we have noticed is that uh, attaching Xcode uh, to the device makes a big difference. So <clears throat> while we're doing these profilings, we, uh, we uh, uh, deploy to the device, then detach Xcode, then run all the profiling. That, that makes a significant difference. So you, uh, you never had situations like it runs just fine in release build, but uh, runs slowly when profiling? Sure. So, <clears throat> so, we, uh, uh, so that for Unity, it has two modes. as a development mode and a master mode, and we... Uh, we kind of try to make the development build as like fast enough. And then we know that the master build is even faster. So uh, yes, there's, there's definitely a difference between the final release and the development. But generally, what we see is that it's it's just uniformly faster, um, mainly on the CPU side. Okay, thanks. Of course. Hi, um, I was wondering uh, for the um, screen sh screenshot comparison things, um, where did you consider um, or did you even try to, um, like instead of just comparing like end frame screenshots like when, when the full scene is composited and so on, just like trying to compare um, intermediate render targets like G-buffers for instance, they, they could also like reveal some, some of, of the issues while significantly, I guess, significantly lowering the noise from introduced by, you know, further things down the render pipeline. <coughs> yeah, that would be a really good idea to uh, also get, uh, make it easier to immediately figure out what the problem was, I suppose. Um, so the advantage of this, uh, well, the, the, the thing that this does is that it just tells us which parts of the game we should look into. And I suppose what you're proposing would also help us in actually finding the error. Yeah, yeah, uh, that, there. That, that was my, yeah. my idea. Yeah, that would be, be a brilliant extension uh, to this. Um, what, so what we usually do is we just figure out, okay, this area is broken, and then we uh, load up the game and do uh, a, a, an Xcode capture or something. That was something similar. Fair enough. Thank you. Yeah, cheers. Thanks. Cool. Um, how much time do we have left? Uh, we have three minutes left. So, yeah. Right. So cool. let's thank you, Michael, one more time. And thank you very much, all of you. Thanks.